Okay, this is going to begin um, us with chapter 12, and chapter 12 focuses on non-renewable energy sources. Now I'm going to split this into a few presentations. The first one we're going to start on coal and oil. The next one will go through natural gas and our alternatives, and then there'll actually be a third one on nuclear. But what they all have in common is that they are non-renewable. So these are all sources that we will run out of. The first one that I like to start with is coal, because coal is our most abundant fossil fuel. This is the one that when we talk about reserves, we have the most years left. And for United States, it is a pretty significant energy source. We get about 32% of our energy, our electricity, from coal. Um, if you look in that graph up in the um, upper right-hand corner, what I do want you to recognize is some of our top countries of coal. Um, our number one producing coal country right now is the United States, followed by Russia, then Australia and China. So it's always a good idea to kind of be able to picture on a map the region where these greatest fossil fuels are. So United States is the most for coal. Now, um, when coal forms, the, the key thing about coal is that it really is a sedimentary rock. So what happens is usually swampy plants, but it is land plants, get buried and exposed to high heat and pressure. So really what's happening is we are laying down a layer of sediments with a lot of plant material in it, and we're turning it into a sedimentary rock. And we'll see, um, uh, I hope, an animation of that in just a second. Now how we get to it, Typically underground or strip mining. And also remember last unit we talked about the possibility of mountaintop removal with coal. So those are all pretty destructive ways of getting coal. So when you think about the life cycle of coal, it is important to recognize that there is that component of mining and transporting um, and the waste associated with that. Now down here, this graphic shows just how important coal is for us. So this was in 2016, um, that coal is this black line right here. And you can see for a very long time, it was a significant source of energy for us um, and has seen a drop off. And one of the reasons why it is dropping off is because natural gas is becoming a more common source for that um, type of energy. I want to see if I can't take us here. Okay, so here's how coal forms. So here we have our swampy plants, and what happens, they die and decompose. They become part of our sediment layers. They're exposed to heat and pressure, and they form a seam of coal. So there you can see that it's formed in those layers of sedimentary rock, and that makes it relatively easy to mine. Now, when we talk about coal, we do have different levels of coal. So our levels of coal are anthracite, bituminous, subbituminous, and lignite. Now, peat isn't really necessarily a coal. This is um, that partially decomposed material that has not been exposed to enough heat and pressure yet to become rock. So <clears throat> when we talk about the quality, what we're referring to is the energy content in that coal. So all of these fossil fuels we'll be talking about are also known as hydrocarbons, which means they have a chain of carbon and they have hydrogens attached. So when you have an anthracite coal, you have a lot of those carbon-carbon bonds, that's where the energy is stored, and not a lot of waste. So you won't have as much, say, sulfur that's attached to an anthracite coal. So it burns um, hotter and it doesn't have as much waste products. Now, an easy way that I like to use to remember the levels of coal is that the best grade you want to get in this class is an A, an A for anthracite. And if you don't want, if you can't settle for an A, a B will do. The prefix sub is below, so this is below bituminous, and then lignite is the loser coal. So that's how I remember them. But you do have to remember the relative order of our types of coal. Now some of the problems with coal is the pollution that it creates. Now one of the biggest ones is carbon dioxide, and we're gonna get into this more in our next unit, but this graphic shows a relationship between carbon dioxide and um, temperature. So the blue line, the zigzag line, is temperature, and the CO2 is the concentration of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. 
And as you can see from about the time of the Industrial Revolution, the levels of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere have increased greatly, and they have surpassed this 410 mark now as of 2018. So we are at carbon dioxide levels that this country or this world has never seen before. And there is a relationship between temperature and CO2. Now, as you can see, there's some anomalies here. So it's not a, a direct relationship, but the overall trend historically in geologic history has been that as CO2 increases, so does temperature. Another problem with coal is sulfur dioxide. Now the reason why we're worried about sulfur dioxide is because sulfur dioxide will lead to acid rain. So we will talk about this again in our air pollution unit. We'll see that these two units really kind of marry each other. Um, but SO2, one of its biggest problems is acid rain, and that's going to lead to problems in our waterways where it will change the pH. It will lower the pH of waters. It will also damage our plants. It can literally burn plant tissue, and it can cause problems with human structures as well. <clears throat> PM stands for particulate matter, and when we burn coal, it puts out small particulates into the atmosphere, and that's an issue because that's a real problem with human health. When it gets into your lungs, it can cause asthma, it can ag aggravate bronchitis, so it can cause a lot of respiratory issues. There are also toxic metals in there. This isn't just pure carbon and hydrogen. It's not just a pure hydrocarbon. So there are toxic metals in there, such as mercury. Mercury is one we've already talked about when it because it biomagnifies. So when we talk about mercury biomagnifying in the food chain, its primary source is the burning of coal. So when we combust coal, it releases mercury, and that makes its way into our waterways, and it can biomagnify up the food chain. And another problem with coal is that it's radioactive. It is a sedimentary rock and it does give off radiation um, as it's just sitting in piles or being burned. So it is radioactive um, and that can cause problems with cancer. So you might be wondering if it's got all this stuff wrong with it, why do we use it? Why is it 32% of our electricity? Well, we have a lot of it. It is the world's most abundant fossil fuel and the United States has the most of it. So we have a lot of it. It's really easy to transport and there's a lot of energy content behind it. So we do have ways to reduce our problems with coal. Now, what we're focusing on is trying to limit the amount of emissions that are coming out. So one big thing that we do is we use a scrubber. So this is a scrubber. So what happens is we're burning our coal, we're creating our electricity, and then the exhaust is put into this scrubber. So here in the scrubber, they will add calcium carbonate or lime, and what that will do is it will create a slurry of that sulfur dioxide. So the calcium carbonate will react with the sulfur dioxide and put it into this like watery slurry that can be put into a landfill. And then further, this is an electrostatic precipitator, and what happens here is the exhaust goes through and those small little particulate matter that we need to worry about that um, bothers our lungs will get taken out by static electricity. So then what comes out here is mostly carbon dioxide. So the sulfur dioxide is taken care of in the scrubber, and the particulate matter is taken care of in the electrostatic precipitator. And so our big one that we do have to worry about is CO2 because these are required for our co all coal plants, but right now CO2 is not a regulated pollutant. So scrubber is definitely one issue that we use to reduce the problems with coal. Another thing you can do is literally clean it before you burn it, spray it down. That takes care of some of the particulate matter. We're going to see a video on capturing and sequestering here in a second. And, in that, and the last one is use a better coal. If you have anthracite, use anthracite. It's going to have a lot of energy with it. You don't have to burn as much. And then also there's less waste products. Uh, the problem is our most abundant coal is bituminous, which is not as clean as anthracite. So here's a video on carbon sequestration. To fight against global warming, the world needs to sharply reduce emissions of carbon dioxide gas, which traps heat in the atmosphere. Power plants that burn coal and other fossil fuels emit much of that CO2, but a technology called carbon capture and storage, or CCS, can keep the gas out of the environment. When fossil fuels are burned, molecules of CO2 are produced along with other gases. 
in a carbon capture system. It attaches only to the CO2. The chemical is then heated to release the gas, producing a stream of pure carbon dioxide that's compressed and sent through a pipeline to a well. The chemical is recycled and used again and again. At the well, the CO2 is injected deep underground, where it spreads out into porous layers of rock and sand. Impermeable rock layers above act as a cap, preventing the gas from rising up and eventually out into the atmosphere. In theory, at least, the gas should stay buried forever. But CCS is expensive, and because it requires so much heat and power, it cuts the electrical output of a generating plant by as much as 20%. As a result, the technology has been slow to be adopted. The pace will have to pick up, scientists say, if the world is to reduce the impact of climate change. So what they were referring to there is the energy that it takes to do that, if we remember from Chapter 2, that it reduces the net energy of coal. So that's one of the other issues there. So we do have the technology to capture and sequester or store that carbon dioxide, but because it is not mandated yet, like SO2, um, we don't have to do it. Countries or companies can choose to do it, though. So coal is our solid fossil fuel. Oil is our liquid fossil fuel. So it's formed in a very similar way. In that this time though it's marine sediments that are buried so here this is algae so this is either phytoplankton or small little zooplankton but they are marine sediments as compared to coal which are swampy land plants so this might start to to get you to think about why we find oil in some places and coal in others it's because oil is only found under areas that were once a ocean so marine sediments are buried they're exposed to heat and pressure and just like coal, they're formed into this fossil fuel over millions of years. Now, the problem with oil, though, is that because it's a liquid, it has to have certain geologic um, conditions present. Coal can form pretty much anywhere, but oil has to have the right geology. So here, in this diagram right here, the source rock, this is where those algae was, uh, that algae was buried and exposed to heat and pressure. So this is where they were partially decomposed and became oil and natural gas is often found with it. So here, it has to be able to collect in a reservoir rock. So it has to be able to collect in a porous rock. But not only that, it also has to be capped on top. Because it's oil, it will keep expanding until it fills its space. And particularly because there's natural gas, that's going to also be providing an upwards pressure. So here, the oil has to be trapped in a reservoir rock, it has to be capped by a rock, and to keep it from spreading horizontally, you also have to have geology come into play that you form this upside down U, which we call an anticline. So you have to have a convergent boundary that comes and pushes these plates together so that you can have this anticline or this inverted U that forms so that you can trap that oil. Another way in geology this can happen is with a slip fault that falls. You just need some type of impermeable rock on top to trap that oil and gas. So it's a little bit harder for oil to form, which is why it's not as common as coal. Now when you think about oil, you should think about the Middle East. That's going to be our largest region of oil. Um, Latin America, particularly Venezuela, um, is our second most uh, abundant area of oil followed by North America. But it's not all the same, so if I look here, um, this is the most recent data I could find that shows Venezuela has moved into the largest oil reserves. And also be aware that I'm using that word appropriately, that it's not just a resource now, that Venezuela was not number one always, but because they have a, a pretty low quality oil sands like Canada, they have surpassed right now Saudi Arabia but still as a region, the Middle East is well known. So Venezuela is right, right now is number one, Saudi Arabia and Canada, but just note that these two countries, Venezuela and Canada, their oil is not as clean.
All right, so I'm going to stop right here with our top three oil countries, and then we're going to pick up next time with the um, mining of oil and the processing of oil. So this will be it for our coal and oil today.